Hello. Hello, various people that are popping in. Hi, Bob, how are you? Haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> Hi there, Peter, how are you going? <laughs> Good. Looking forward to today, looking forward to it. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you've been a good uh, a good representative for us with a couple of jobs, so we're always appreciative of that. No, and it's <laughs> very, so. very easy to reference you. So that's very easy. So they've all, they've all got the same problem. <laughs> and I must notice Stuart German, who can probably hear me. I, I see you're not on at 10 o'clock now, Stuart. You're on at 12. <laughs> Our time. Yeah. Hello, Stuart. Dear. Yeah, I was tricked. That's okay. <laughs> nice. Good Sorry. to see you, Peter. <laughs> Good to see you too. Yeah, yeah. Are you coming over for the National Franchising Convention? No, no, I'm no. not. I normally I do. I'll wait another no, no. year. Yes. I oh, so yes. could imagine that's a good idea not to at the moment. Yeah. Everything's going a bit pear shaped. <laughs> we're, about, we're about two months behind you in New Zealand. So COVID's rampant at the moment and deaths are, are the highest they've ever been. Yeah. yeah, well, you guys are obviously out of it for a long yeah. time and didn't really have yeah. the issues we had here, but our numbers are going through the roof. And yeah, at least we're not trying to be like China and trying to like <laughs> lock down Shanghai to totally get rid of no. it. Good luck. No. Yeah. Okay, well, look, uh, I think I will get started. Uh, obviously, firstly, thank you, people, for coming on board and uh, doing this with us. We are also going to record this and make it available as a webinar uh, through our websites and social media. So a couple of the first couple of slides are probably going to be a bit uh, <laughs> standard because we just say who's who in the zoo. But let me get started and uh, we have about an hour and I look forward to uh, working with you as we go with this project. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, territory planning. This is all about using data to make better business decisions. And uh, as I know I've got Stuart on from New Zealand, we've done quite a lot with New Zealand. We've even done a lot worldwide with companies, uh, people like F45 Training, where we've set up all their territories in the United States uh, and in across England and other places. So. The same logic works and the data is normally available for any country, basically worldwide. So, okay, very simple. My name's Peter Buckingham. I think you know that. So we'll let that one fly through. Uh, my background has been uh, spectrum analysis for 20 years. I am a certified franchise executive. And I'm happy to say for anyone who hasn't seen it, this actually says we are the supplier of the year for the FCA. So, uh, well, supply for till they decide to have another conference that's going to take us out of that. Hopefully, we'll last 18 months. Okay, we also have a couple of things coming up. Uh, we are going to be at the National Franchise Convention, which is next Monday, Tuesday. And we're also tied up with AHESA because we do a lot of work with schools these days. Anyone who's involved in schools knows that's the Headmasters Association. I also have on board Doreen, Doreen Lyons. And Dory will handle uh, the chat as and when that gets going uh, near the end of this and take all the questions. Thanks, Peter. And uh, just some information on Spectrum. This is because this whole webinar is recorded and be available for you. Okay, so the first thing I want to touch on is why, I'm just going to get rid of some of the extra things. Uh, what do we want and why? So I have a bit of a view that everybody calls this territories. And I have a view that territories really only apply when you have uh, something that's tied in with like a head office and you've got a call centre and you've got to have things exactly where the location, because you'd be pretty annoyed if you didn't get a job as a mortgage broker and, and went to the guy across the road because the company got it a bit wrong and he got the $50,000 commission and you missed out. So territories, when we do them, especially for anything that has a... Uh, call centre type thing where allocating leads is incredibly important. That's to me a really strong territory, barbed wire fence around the outside, think of the Berlin Wall and you don't want to get it wrong. What most businesses we deal with though really only just want what I'll call an exclusion zone. So that means if you're going to be a franchisee and it's a bricks and mortar type operation, 
you just want to know the franchise or isn't going to open another one in your backyard. And to be honest, that's really what we probably should be calling most of the work we do is setting up exclusion zones. But the territory word, I guess, keeps coming up. Then the lower level of that is what we'll often call marketing areas, where somebody just says, look, I want to have a long-term arrangement, but I've only got 10 franchisees. Look, you look after that whole area and you look after that area, you look after there, put your flyers out, do what you like, take all the leads, but eventually we're going to come down. This is way bigger than your territory is, but this is just what you can look after for now when we do delivery drops into letterboxes. So I'm a big believer that that's sort of the way we sort of go, but we always keep calling everything a territory. So I guess the first thing I say is don't use the T word unless you have to. If it's a service business, definitely a territory. In a lot of cases, it's really an exclusion zone. And I think that makes it clearer to the end user. Uh, so the aim of what we try to do is, I like to say, is to be, for a franchisor to be able to put, put up their hand, hand on their heart in front of a group of franchisees in years to come and say each territory offered similar sales potential based on certain assumptions. Now, somebody's going to put their hand up and say, I've made a million bucks. Someone else is going to say it's the worst thing I ever did in my life. And probably your answer to that is, well, if you got out of bed before one o'clock in the morning, you may do it better. But at the end of the day, what this is all about is trying to give each franchise a similar amount of opportunity in any way you can bring that together. So I like to think of it as a chessboard approach. And we'll talk a bit further on, I might even do it twice down the way we go through this, is how do you actually come up with the numbers to say how many territories you want in Australia or New Zealand or whatever we're doing. And to give you an example, when we did uh, F45s, we ended up at over 10,000 territories across the United States. But it doesn't really matter what the big number is. What you're trying to do is come up with an approach that gives you a logic you can sort of work to and explain for the future. The worst thing you can ever do, in my view, is be one of these franchises that says, oh, look, I've sold 10 territories. And the next thing is going back to the franchisees saying, oh, look, I want to have your area back because I want to cut it in half. Well, someone described that to me as give a three-year-old an ice cream, ask them to have a couple of licks and then go and take the ice cream off them and watch for the tantrum that comes up. We're a big believer that our aim is to cut the territories to whatever the longer term position is going to be. So if you think, take it your 10 or 15 year time frame of we think we're going to have 130 across Australia, and I'll use that number for logic, uh, then even if you've only got five or 10 now, you're better to cut for that 130 now. And you can easily say to somebody, you've bought your territory, but can you caretake these other territories for five years, two years, one year, whatever it is, but my long-term vision is to have 130 across Australia. Now, you never probably get there. You might get to 60, you might get to 80, but at least you've got your rules set up and you're not in that other case. I did a job for, and I can talk about them now because they've all gone pear-shaped, was cleans made here in Australia years ago. And they had about 15 stores, each had a territory. I think there's 80 in Sydney, five in Melbourne. And everything was going along. And then they called a conference and they said, oh, by the way, you've all paid half a million bucks to have your area and become a franchisee. We're now going to double the number of franchises. So we're going to cut your territories in half. Well, you may know that two brothers ended up in jail and a whole lot of other things went pear shaped. But the point of this is don't be excessive, but don't be too few. You cannot unscramble the egg. It makes it very, very difficult. So... The other thing we like to say is if you do the chessboard approach and you end up with a web-based mapping system, I'm quoting here from F45 training, they have four ratings. Every, everywhere across America is shown as either sold, available, can be reserved for a particular potential franchisee. So that might be saying, look, you want that area, we'll lock it to you for a time. We'll, won't sell it to anyone else for six months, 12 months, whatever you want to do, put a time on it for heaven's sake. And then the last thing they often have was a no-go zone. Now that might be really like a reserve, but for a longer period. So a no-go zone might be 
We've got franchisee A here, we've got franchisee B here. There is a territory in between. Maybe it's a growth area. And for the next five years, we've agreed we're not going to do anything with it. But if you're going to have a no-go zone, put a time limit on it. But that way, everything's covered and you've got a direction you're going on any area. So it takes all of this query or lack of confidence in what you're trying to do out because the franchisees hopefully know what's going to happen. Now, something like F45, where we cut over 10,000 territories, as Rob Deutsch said to me, he said, at the end of the day, I don't care if I give away two territories. Still a fantastic number, 5,000 across America. But at least I know that I'm not giving away the equivalent of a state of America because some bloke told or some lady told me I had to give them this huge area. So at least it made everything a sort of similar size starting point that they could all work for, no matter where they were across America. So the old way of doing this used to be what I'll call a beer and pizza map. And normally a beer and pizza map starts off with franchisor, some of the early franchisees, bottle of red wine, couple of beers and a pizza, and a black text to colour. And we've all seen the typical beer and pizza map. The funny thing was we had that map in our office for years. I've had it up like this. And suddenly uh, one of people who attended one of my webinars, or sorry, it was a full day conference course, said, that's our territories. And he admitted that he remembered it from years before. It was a traditional beer and pizza map. So there was no logic. It was just black lines. So we're a big one of the best way is to go through some process. So the process normally starts with an analysis phase, set the rules, have a clear understanding of what you're trying to do. Maybe you do construct a target market index map to sort of say these are going to be the better areas. But as I'll explain further on, the idea how we do it is, yes, that might be the best area, but that's going to be a bit smaller. And then another area that isn't so good for what you're trying to sell is not so good, it needs to be a bit bigger. At the end of the day, we're trying to give similar opportunity. So we have an analysis space. Maybe we do a thematic map. We calculate the average population or number of businesses that are required. And then we like to also look at the existing locations. So very early in the processes, we will map all of the existing territories so we can comfortably know what they are, maybe measure them, and then we can work our way on what we're going to do going forward. And our aim is to define territories to meet the criteria, basically adjusting the population depending on what the target market index is. So I'll explain that a bit further as we go forward. So the analysis phase. This can be done in many ways, but normally it starts off by saying, who are the best customers? How far do they come from? And what we're trying to do is work out the drivers of your business. Now, sometimes it's just a matter of discussion. Uh, I'll give an example of if I was doing a, a gym group, uh, F45, body fit, anything we can think of that's in that sort of space, anytime fitness. You're going to know fairly much that your probably common sense is going to say our target market's probably going to be 20 to 45 year olds, 20 to 40. If it's Fernwood Fitness, it might be more like female only, 30 to 50. I'm sure they might tell me it's younger and older, but it doesn't really matter. What we're trying to do is define that from a starting point. And that can be work on looking at the, you might have a data set that says, here's everybody, here's their addresses, here's their age. Guess what? We can use that to come up with database solution. Secondly, you might say, look, we are the Rolls Royce of gyms and we're going to charge $100 a week. Well, guess what? You're not going to work very well in lower socioeconomic areas. You're going to do much better in higher. Or you could be the low-cost player says we're at 24-7 and we're going to absolutely slash the market. We're going to offer $10 a week. Well, they're probably going to be much better off in lower socioeconomic areas because by the time you get to the higher socioeconomic areas, uh, they're already going to something of, of a different standard. So what we're trying to do is work out with people who are, you know, what are the drivers of our business? Now, that can be done really well if we actually have uh, some, if we actually know who the customers are. So if we can geocode and map the customers, 
then we can actually look at every single area in terms of customers per available population. So let's say my theory is 20 to 45 year old females, uh, might be uh, a Dala Bolter's uh, group, which is all about female, young, and F45 for ladies. And then what we can say is how many of those people live in that area compared to how many customers you've got? Call it market share or penetration, it all works out. So what we're trying to do is work out our best customers and therefore look at what we're going to do going forward to find areas of best potential. So phase one of an analysis, who's the customer? How can we put that into demographic terms that we can see in terms of sensors and measurement, things that are defined? No good saying we like people that are left-handed or we like uh, ladies who are, uh, I'm going to say, you know, like to go to do more makeup and do hard gym work. That's the sort of stuff we don't see in the census. We're all about what can we measure. So the second phase of this is how many territories do we want long term? And therefore, backwards, what is a realistic trade area for the business? Now, a lot of businesses, we will try early to map the customers around some of the locations. And normally we feel that a trade area is probably where 60 to 80% of the customers come from. There's nothing purely logical and perfect about it. And in some industries, basically, there's little ge geographic relevance. So, for example, we work with some of the mortgage broking companies. And no secret, we do some work for Aussie Home Loan, Rams, we've done ANZ Mobile Lending, different things like that. And I can remember one of those companies said to me, oh, this person has a territory. And out of the, I think it was 40 uh, loans they've written in the last year, only two or three of them had come from inside their territory because they were the guru of one of the uh, Chinese or Vietnamese groups and they were doing writing territories in Queensland even though they were based in Sydney. So it doesn't have to necessarily follow, but common sense always says you are, should be more looking at getting your customers from your nearby locations and not from sort of running all over the place because your whole business concept, the franchise then becomes totally out of control. So we would like to think when we map, we're going to start to see where the customers should come from. So we have the ability to put a dot on a map. Now you could say you can do it yourself using Google Maps, good fun doing about 500, good fun doing 5,000. We have geocoding software, so we can say here's all 5,000, and the geocoder will go and put them as best it can to the location. So once we've got that and we can see it into online mapping, we can then even measure this idea of how many customers we've got per thousand in each postcode, suburb, and see it's where the customers come from. Now, this is just a simple one. It's in Cronulla. Uh, so I recall it was actually a, uh, a club but you can actually see the dots are the dots on the map. But that looks pretty messy when you try and say, well, you know, how many dots have I got in that area compared to here if I was trying to work out my customers per thousand population. But once you've got the dots on the map, you can very quickly then go, okay, it was very simple. This first group had 20 to 100 members per thousand population. The light blue had uh, 10 to 20. Then you got... The white was uh, five to 10, two to five, and then two or under. So if you were going to do your local area marketing, firstly, there's a peninsula down here you'd think seriously about that's obviously underrepresented. And you can see as you come out further, uh, obviously the penetration drops away. And that really starts giving us an idea to say, well, how far out should we go to call it a reasonable trade area and therefore, you start saying, if we were going to have, I'll be really simplistic and not even use suburbs or postcodes, even if we said three kilometres radius represents 70% uh, of the customers, then logic says you're not going to cover everybody, but probably if two locations were five kilometres apart, and you think of the old Venn diagram, then you're not going to have much of overlap in the middle. So... We work in terms of what we'll call unit of demand. 
unit of demand I like to think of somewhere years ago, you probably did some really basic accounting, even if it was at school, and somebody said, look, you start off with 10 widgets and you move one and you sell eight, you make a bit of a profit. You go, what's a widget? Well, a widget doesn't exist. Well, units of demand are like widgets. And what we're just trying to do is be able to do a comparison of one area to another in the potential. So if you want to think of one widget equals $10 of potential sales, that's your call, not mine. All I'm trying to do is make it so that each area offers similar demand. But I guess if one area had 10,000 units of demand and sold $100,000 worth of product, and another area also had 10,000 units of demand and only sold $20,000 worth of product, you'd think, well, we're getting good potential out of the first area, and we're obviously undershooting on the second. But maybe it's because the first area is right near where our business is and the other one's five, 10 kilometres away. So when we go to B2C, business to consumer, which is, you know, selling into houses and the normal day-to-day, -day, so there's only two ratings, B2C and B2B. I think everyone knows what B2B, business to business, which I'll touch on a bit further. But if we've got a product that's business to consumer, might be mowing lawns, might be selling dim sims, don't care. We can think of it this way. Imagine one person only lives in every postcode. Now, we know how many people actually live in every postcode or suburb, but let's say we just imagine one. And if one is the average and one could be worth a cent, a dollar, doesn't matter what it is, that's the probability of that person being a good or bad customer. So in an area that's good for our business, we might say instead of selling a dollar's worth, we're going to sell a dollar fifty. And in an area that's poor for our business, we might say instead of selling a dollar, we're only likely to sell 50 cents. Now, this may be defined by demographics, all the sort of things we talked about of knowing the drivers of our business. So what we're trying to do is explain the customer's type and behaviour and put it into these demographic terms we can measure. So I'll give you an example. Say I was a mortgage broker. Now, common sense tends to tell us, I'll just take this as a, a guesstimate, mortgage brokers, uh, the banks tend to hold the higher end of the market. People have been there longer. So Combank, ANZ, et cetera. But mortgage brokers tend to be better with the younger people, uh, probably first home buyers, people who need them to come to their house to, you know, make a call at seven at night to talk to the wife as well, all this sort of stuff. So let's just say common sense says to me, mortgage brokers are going to do better in lower, in lower income sort of areas, probably with younger people who are less likely to have a relationship with the bank. And the banks are more likely to be better in higher to medium income and older people because we were taught that way. So if I want to turn that into a measurable item, I could say maybe what I look at is the percentage of households with income of, let's say, 700 to 1,500, which is probably 35 to uh, $75,000. Maybe I need to move that up a bit. The slide has been around a while. And I'd probably say percentage of people, 20 to 35. Or I might go Sorry? It's a comment. Oh. Um, Okay, so let's just assume there are assumptions. So very quickly, our brain will tell us it might be areas like Springfield, Albion Park, Berwick, Clyde, these sort of areas, and Werribee around Melbourne. And that will be the areas our mortgage broking probably will do better. They're, for one person, it's probably 1.5 probability of going with us. And yet areas like Windsor in Queensland, Mosman, Neutral Bay, Camwell, Hawthorne, Turak, are much more likely to be the traditional of the bank. So what we're trying to do is make it so that each area comes back with the same potential so we can maximise the number of territories without being stupid and ending up trying to give somebody a territory in Camwell, Hawthorne or something like that with the same number of households in it. Mind you, the probably uh, average loan is going to be higher, but... Obviously, the mortgage broker is probably going to do much better over in Werribee or Clyde or uh, Albion Park or something like that. So 
We're trying to get it so each territory is equal and have the maximum number of realistic sustainable territories. So the logic behind it is that it can be explained to a potential and existing franchisee. You want to be able to speak the language. I don't want to make this super complicated with 10 different variables. You need a PhD to understand it. You want it in simple two, two variable, maybe three variable that a franchisee and a franchisor can talk to each other about. You want it to be definable and reproducible. And actually you want it dependable not that we've had many legal challenges for a long time, but if you do need to stand up and add your honour onto the end of every sentence, you'd want to be able to say or have us stand in there for you saying, look, this was done on a logic, everything we've made, so each territory had similar potential and we couldn't help it that our franchisee wouldn't get out of bed till one o'clock in the morning. So that really is about having the advantages of having this sort of work done. The next thing I want to talk about is data and what we can use. Now, I'm just going to touch through on three or four, five different data sets. One is almost gone to God, the 2016 census. I'll come in a bit more on 2021 census, and that's when we're expecting to see it at the level that really will become usable to us. We have population estimates, so we've already moved from 2016 to 2021. We do that with ABS data to move things forward. So if we're doing a territory planning job now, we're not just going back and saying this was a population in 2016. We also have all the business count data. So when we'll talk about B2B, we're not just guessing how many businesses are in an area. There is a data base on it. We talk about CIFA, which I'll come on in a minute, Socioeconomic Index for Areas. And the last thing we use a lot of is the ABS put out population forecasts, 2017 to 2032 at SA2 level. Now, SA2 is similar to postcodes, pretty close to a postcode, similar size. But they actually tell us how many people they're expecting out to 2032 by age group. I'll come back to it. Census, 2016, 2021. In New Zealand, 2011 was postponed. They're at 2013 and then they did a 2018 census. So they're now two years out of kilter to Australia. But the big thing is this 2022 census, uh, 21 census is coming out in a week or two, oh, sorry, a couple of months' time. And we'll move everything in our systems up to accommodate once that happens. Type of data we can see from the census. For an area will be how many people live there, what's their age profiles, and in this case, we're comparing it to Melbourne, Metro Victoria, Melbourne Geelong, let's call it. So you know what we'll call a demographic summary. We can see the age group, and you have to multiply that by that to get how many people, and we can compare it whether we're in an older or younger area, and we even have here just a calculation to compare apples to apples about what the average age is. Now, across Australia, average age 37, 38, pretty normal. An older area will come up like about 42. Uh, and a young area like a Werribee or an Albion Park or something will probably come up more like 32 or 33 and everything in between. The census tells us all the things to do with marital status. Married, so this area is around Turek in Melbourne. A lot of uh, young people, rent and come in there, a lot of university uh, students, nursing because of the hospitals, all sorts of things. So you've got 50% 50 never married against an average of 36. You've got 51% renting compared to a Melbourne average of 31. You've got a lot of semi-detached apartments, 57% so apartments compared to a Melbourne average of 14. And this 25 to 34 year old. So you can very quickly get a feeling of what the area is like. Birthplace, nothing particular, bit of English, bit of New Zealand, 66% uh, born in Australia. Now, the second part of that often comes, I think, under there is China. So not a, not a big Chinese, pretty average uh, area. We then have data over this side. Again, these pages follow one to the other of uh, family status, never married, parent without uh, single parent families, different things. We then have talk about household income. 
and we compute that to say, well, just in simplicity, what's the average household income of against Melbourne's average? So Melbourne's average was 98, this area had 120. Because we do a lot of work with tyres and oil companies and things, we've always done a bit of things about the vehicles. And as you'd expect, in, the, in an area like that, a lot of people, one car, parking's a problem. Uh, by the time we get to the outer suburbs, we had a lot more people with two and even three cars. Language spoken at home often is a better proxy for ethnicity because these days a lot of people may take Spring Vale or Cabramatta, fairly strong Vietnamese communities, but these days a lot of the people were actually born now in Australia, the kids and even grandkids. So we get a bit of a feel of the ethnicity through that. And in this case, it picks up Caulfield and a few things like that that picks up a big Jewish area. But sometimes we do things that uh, want us to talk about uh, religion as well. So the census gives us a great starting point for everything. We updated ourselves internally on population for a couple of ways. Second thing I just want to touch on is socioeconomic index for areas. And I often rudely say, does this mean you're living in the affluent or the affluent? So your top areas here, your Turex, your uh, Bellevue Hills in Sydney and Mosmans, and some of the uh, Windsor and things in Brisbane are out here. Here is your lower socioeconomic areas, maybe in Sydney or St Mary's in Melbourne, it might be out your uh, uh, Coolaroos, and if you remember the film, The Castle, they're all out here. But even in the Melbourne, the capital areas, they're still at about this level. And it's really when you run out into the country, you get down to the bottom. Now, CIFA is the government's way of working out rather than saying, are we, what is your average income or what is your level of unemployment? They get the whole lot, shuffle it together. What is the price of your house? All of these sort of factors to come up with a one way of comparing apples to apples in all areas across Australia. So Sydney predominantly has more higher socioeconomic, partly driven by the price of housing, where, say, Adelaide, Hobart will have more lower to middle socioeconomic just because the housing prices and things aren't so solid. But we love it because it compares apples to apples, and when you're looking at all of Sydney or all of Melbourne, you see the higher socioeconomic areas compared to the lower ones. And I'll show you that a bit further on. I'm now going to just come into territory planning on B2B because some of the businesses we work with are pure B2B businesses. You might be uh, MBE or Snap Printing or something. And these days, they'll always tell you they are a B2B business, not much for you to see. So the data we get for Australia, and my recollection is 2020 is the latest version at this point. We're waiting for 2021. Allows us to see how many businesses there are in all areas. And I'll come to the next slide, show you the picture. But the main point is they have these ANSIC categories, Australia, New Zealand, industry classification. So all businesses get classified. They have it as non-employing businesses or employing businesses that have one to four employees, five to 19, 20 to 199, 200 plus. Now in New Zealand, that only goes to 100, then 100 plus. And you ask, how do they know this? Well, every business, when it puts in its tax return, it says, what does it do and how many people does it employ? So, of course, the ATO's data goes to the ABS and they're able to work that through. Now, they're always very secretive and they don't want you to be able to work anything out, which always made me laugh because it's an area in Adelaide called Salisbury and they didn't want to know how many businesses were over 200 employees, so they wouldn't tell you those sort of numbers, but anyone who knows Salisbury knows there's only one business used to be there with the Holden Engine Works that employed 5,000 and there wouldn't have been another business over 200 in the whole area. But they like to be secretive and who are we to argue? So again, I'm sorry this is 2019, but the way the data comes to us is by ANZIC category, by this Australia-wide, by how many total businesses, by how many don't employ, and how many have one to four, five to 19, 20 to 199, and 200 plus. Now we do a little bit of arithmetic here to sort of come up with 
approximates of how many that incurs we expect to be in each of those businesses and do a little bit of comparison to say, is this area higher or lower in some of these fields? Now, in this case, that hasn't been filled in. But just so you can see where this business, if you're in a CBD, will have a higher majority of things like uh, financial and insurance, professional, uh, the, the white collar type of businesses. And if you're in uh, an outer or even a heavy industrial area, Bayswater, Footscray, something like that, you'll see much more of the manufacture, the wholesale trade, uh, different types of things, transporting and warehousing. So you get a feel of what the areas are like. So what we do with this is if we're doing a B2B, we say to the client, who are your customers? And we help them with this, obviously. And if we can sort of say, okay, I'm selling something that's much more, uh, let's say I'm more like an MBE or a snap printing, and we're doing these days much more uh, pack and send, we're, we're working with people about moving things around, then a lot of our customer will be this sort of wholesale trade, that type of business. If we're something completely the opposite, we're supplying uh, new computers or the best end computers possibly, it could be something that costs $2,000, then we're going to be much more in the financial insurance, professional, administrative, those sort of things. So we have a way of putting a score. And the way I like to say to people, and I've done it with clients, think of your best 50 customers, where would they fit into this sort of category? And therefore, it gives us a, a real reality check to see what we're working with. We also like to say to businesses, <clears throat> who is your customer? And you might say, I'll give a good example, is we've done a few businesses that are bookkeeping type. Now, some one-man show probably does it themselves. Even a one to four may do it themselves or may get a bookkeeping company. The typical uh, client for a bookkeeping company is probably this, the five to 19. And then by the time people may be over 200 or over 20, they're starting to have their own internal resource. And definitely by the time they're at 200, they've probably got a CFO and they're out of the range of a, a bookkeeping type of company. So again, you can end up sort of putting different power and weighting to how much you want to see based on the type of business you, you attract. So clients, and I'm sure they won't mind me mentioning them because they are also our bookkeeper, first-class accounts. Uh, they are much stronger around this area than they're likely to be up here or probably even in the non-employing business of the one to four. So that's their hotspot for any bookkeeping type business. Okay, so again, if I go back to my unit of demand type of thing, and I can therefore say in each area or postcode, and I will just touch on we believe that somewhere near, a number near two to 300, probably 300 just, there's roughly 2,600 postcodes in Australia. Now, if a client says, oh, we want to have 500 territories, someone like uh, Poolworks or something like that, then we can't use postcodes because they're too lumpy. Some of the bigger postcodes like Reservoir, uh, Camp, Camp, uh, Campbelltown down in Sydney, uh, Glen Waverley, Mount Waverley, they become too big and you're starting to have to cut the postcode in half or quarters. So there's a number of probably about 300 maximum that you say after that, we've got to go from postcode down to suburb, but we can work either way. So if we start to know the unit of demand and we say that suburb is a 0.8, this one's a 1.2 and this one's a 0.5, and we can just multiply it by either the number of people that are in there and come up with our unit of demand, or if it's numbers of businesses, same rules apply. We can run, multiply the number of businesses by the suitability of that type of business for what we're trying to do by the ranking of the size of the business. So I'm not trying to overcomplicate, but it just means there are three, two or three variables come together to make it so that each territory, once get added together, the postcodes, the suburbs, the make up the territory. So each one adds up to the similar amount of units of demand. They're never perfect. I've seen some American software come out that sort of tries to cut a little bit out of here and another couple of SA1s, which were the old census collection districts and try and make every territory exactly equal. The problem is, how do you explain that to the franchisee? 
oh, your territory is these postcodes, half of these suburbs, bits of these SA1s, standard area ones, and we've drawn a line around it, so we've made it exactly right. Stupid. We believe that if territories are probably 5 10%, plus or minus, it's going to suit the purpose. And especially if it's more like exclusion zones, then it really is saying, this is your area. Probably you can drop flyers off into that area, as simple as dropping off flyers or putting up uh, ad shields inside bus shelters. That's your marketing. That's your area. And the other area, but each one's not exactly perfect. They don't need to be. So I'm just going to go back to this question of how many territories should you have. I always find this is a big one at the beginning of working with a client. And quite often they say, uh, we don't know, have no idea. And without being rude, I'll often say to our client, well, don't ask me. I don't do your business plan, but I'll help you as much as we can. So what we're trying to do is say, let's work up a logic. And we like to think of the customer spread of the existing areas as a startup and trying to talk about where we want to be in 10 or 15 years and extrapolate accordingly. Now, look, sometimes this comes from the top down. The boss has said we're going to have 130 across Australia. Okay, if that's what you want, we're happy to do it. But I like to be a bit smarter than that and say, well, let's go to an area you know. Now, there are a couple of really good areas that make it easy to work with. One is the Shire in Sydney because it's very defined. Uh, sometimes there's sort of areas in Melbourne we can sort of look at uh, and say, well, around this area. And what I try to do is suggest maybe it's even the area around where the franchisor lives and say, well, okay, you've got a bit of an idea in your head what makes up a territory. And I'll call it the cookie cutter approach. Because if I can get the cookie cutter in demographic terms, then I can say, once we've agreed on that, I can bump, bump, bump my way around and make similar territory sizes in demographic terms. So the first thing I'll often say is, let's talk about the area you know best. Oh, yeah, look, I've been running a territory for 10 years. I think these five suburbs or these three postcodes are about the size it needs to be. If I was selling the franchise, I could convince people of that. Perfect. We can then measure it, say how many units of demand, come up with a formula, and then what we'll often do is make three or four other territories around that for them, maybe make them 20% bigger, 20% smaller, get it so they can see it, and then we'll come up with a final product. The beauty is once you've got it to that, and you might do it around your home base, could be Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, we can use the same rules then to go to the next city. So you might be Melbourne-based. You've ended up saying, okay, Peter, let's do Melbourne. We end up cutting 25 territories across Melbourne. Then you say, I want to go to Sydney. I want to use the same rules. Perfect. We'll probably end up about 32 territories across Sydney, but you know with confidence the same rules are applying to every area you go across Australia. So just to give you an idea, and I used 130 earlier and why I do that it's just in rough numbers and sure this is the 2016 census and Sydney and Melbourne are growing a bit but if we talk of Sydney as Newcastle to Wollongong and Melbourne Geelong Brisbane Sunshine Coast the Gold Coast included Perth down to Rockingham and Adelaide if you had 100 territories you do about 34 in Sydney Newcastle Wollongong 28 in Melbourne 19 in Brisbane 12 in Perth about seven in uh, Adelaide now, why I use that number is we often talk to people that 100 in the five main capital cities normally ends up at about 30 in the regional areas. And I'm calling Canberra region, might be worth two, Hobart, Darwin, Townsville, Cairns, the big cities, Ballarat, Bendigo, working our way around Australia, you normally get 20 to 30 that become the regional areas. And it's just to give you an idea, and I realise we're offering this site slide set out to everybody who's uh, come on board, you'll see all the numbers, rough numbers, or sorry, they were the populations of these towns and what they were back in 2016. But it gives you a good starting point. Uh, I always find one that always pops out is Launceston. People don't realise, 75,000. Uh, and then sometimes there are ones, when you come down this sort of list of where I'm going to do territories, someone might come to you and say, oh, I want to do Swan Hill or I want to do Pachuca. Well, guess what? 
They're not appearing on the list before you should be doing Townsville and Cairns and Toowoomba and hit the big ones first. So just to give you a rough number in Australia, and these are the census numbers from the previous censuses, um, five main capital cities were about 16.6 .6 million, 1.48 million were the next 23 towns or cities, and then the rest of Australia is about 5.3 million, and that ended up at the 23 million that the last census told us we had. So again, any time that 130 number is one half the news, because it normally ends up about 100 in the five main capital cities, and then about 30 out in the, in the regions. Pretty common model, that's what I was talking about there. And uh, you can see, we do know the growth that's going on, and we'll see it when this new census comes out. Uh, Sydney's been pretty stable, Melbourne's been pretty strong. Uh, for periods there, Brisbane and Perth have been good. They've probably slowed down a bit. And as much as the Adelaides and people say we're in growth, we're going great, they're still not growing in Hobart. They're not going to grow like Melbourne and Sydney. End of the day, we start being able to come up with a territory map, followed by any individual territory people want can be done can then be part of a uh, territory planning and go into an agreement. <clears throat> I like to use postcodes, Australia Post postcodes, because number one, we can add them together, about 2,600 across Australia. They define, they rarely change, do something, easy to map, but the biggest thing about it is they're easy to understand. The average punter, they understand postcodes. You ask somebody where they live, they know their postcode, you want to tell somebody about three or four postcodes, it all makes sense to people. So if I'm under 300, which is 90% of our jobs, 95% of our territory planning jobs, I say use Australia Post postcodes, but be aware the ABS's postcodes are different to the postman's postcode. Now, I can't fix that, but so often people might get an American company in and they go and grab the ABS's postcodes, and guess what? They don't line up with the ABS the Australia's postcodes. We will often do their data packs, which become residential, show the residentials of an area, the business data of an area, the territory map, and even a business hit list that says these are the uh, potential businesses to mail out to to say you're coming into the area. Jumping forward very quickly, because I haven't got much time left, sorry about this. Uh, we are very much into electronic mapping now. We, I'm going to give a quick demo. And the beauty of, you know, let the picture tell the story. I often get people say, oh, we get data and we download it and we're downloading this from the ABS and we're going to do some territory work. And I say, well, good luck, because without a geographic information system, you can't actually see it. So GIS is the most important thing and we use it all the time. We use one that we call, which is Mango Maps. I'm hoping I can jump onto it now just to show you. It's a demo that you'll be able to click onto and open it. So, Sue, where is my share screen? Mango Maps. Okay. So this is, firstly, I can come in or out just using my roller. Anything I want, I can just turn on and off with here. So let me just start by saying, imagining I am Spectrum car washes. So the first thing I can do is click on my Spectrum car wash and up will come the data about it because I've had this loaded in previously. Even to what the socioeconomic score of the area is, how many people live within certain radiuses, whatever data we want to put in that box, we can. So that's that one, there's one over here, whatever we want. Okay, secondly, we might want to see our competitors. So we'll just turn them on and we can jump on that. So this one here is uh, Rubber Dub Car Wash. There's in Camboil. You can see I can turn on and off any of my competitors. Now, I may have a territory. At the moment, I think the territories are on. Here they are here. So if I just click the side of that box, it'll actually tell me some stuff about the territory. And by the way, I can take a print of this. So if I just wanted to see that territory, and put it in my little box, I could probably turn all the others off and just turn that one on. I'm a bit slow on this myself. 
If there is a way, you can just turn the one on you want. Oh, there we go, they will come on again. But we can make it so that happens. Then I can send it to print or as it is, I can just print that out now and say, look, this is going to be your territory and stick that in your agreement. Quite easy to do. A lot of our clients use Mango Maps and print their own territories. Now, from there, we can do even some demographics. Let me just kill the other territories. And we will sort this out even better when the new census comes out. So I want to look at the demographics of that area. It, we've just loaded here what the population is, various age things, household income and the average age, just for a way to compare apples to apples. But once it's in there, you can do all these different things. You might say, because in this, uh, this case, these uh, car washers, they like to know uh, where they often try and get in underground with a big uh, shopping centre. So they might want to know where the Kmarts are. They might even want to know where all the shopping centres are. It's all data that we can load into this and make it very easy for you. And even different layers, like I'll just bring up the CIFA layer, socioeconomic index for Melbourne. So I can look at an area here like Q. Very quickly, I can see, I'm hoping, Q is a CIFA 1120 high socioeconomic, I can go over to Reservoir, which is one of those huge postcodes, a really big one, which is interesting, and it's 3073, oh, sorry, C for 939, so much lower. So the idea of this web-based mapping is we find now, whenever we do a territory planning job for people, we can actually ask our Mango Maps, can we use it for a month as a freebie? We set everything up with it, show our client, let them play with it. And then we say to them, if you want to keep it, it costs about $1,300 a year. If you don't want it, that's okay. We'll give you hard copies or whatever you want, and it will be turned off. 99% uh, right now are saying, don't you dare turn it off because that's what we're now using. And I assume when we go to the Franchise Expo in the next couple of days, uh, we'll be there on Friday, we'll see a lot of our clients trying to sell their territories uh, using the Mango Maps. So to us, it's been a great way, a low cost way to help people uh, sort out their, their things. Sorry, Sue, I might not have my shared screen again. You know, Peter, you have one. Okay, let me just share. Yep. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay, we're back to normal, Sue? No, you need to share the screen and share PowerPoint. Okay, sorry. PowerPoint, Sue, so all right. There we go. I'm still an apprentice at this. I might know a bit about mapping, but I'm never very good on this part. Okay. So, look, um, hopefully we're there. Okay, so, look, I'm just going to say, in conclusion, make informed decisions and get it right the first time. The worst cases I find is someone comes to us and says, oh, look, we didn't want to spend any money. We did a few territories ourselves, and then we get a logic and worked out. They've given away the equivalent of four or five territories each time, and you can't unscramble the egg. And the classics could be that you're a guru in Sydney or you know Melbourne, and someone rings you from Perth. They want to take your franchise. Fantastic. You know, give me everything north of the uh, Swan River. And guess what? You've just given away eight territories and you can't undo it. So our view is whether you use us, you use someone else, or do it yourself, do something so that each territory is made to be a similar opportunity and that is so much better for the long-term uh, value of your business and, not, and be able to stand there in 10 years' time, each territory was made hand on heart to give a similar amount of opportunity. Hopefully that's where we're at now. And uh, I'm gonna let the girls come back on now and uh, tell me what we're doing from the chat point of view. Any questions? Or I'll take any questions. Uh, Peter, hi, thanks for that. Uh, there was a question earlier um, from one of our participants and that related to what socio, what socio demographic data would be available from Google, do you think? Uh, I don't think any from Google as such. I'm not aware of any. The thing we use is CIFA from the ABS, which I think is a free download, but you then get 
you've got to understand it's all in, in an Excel spreadsheet, which makes it very hard to play with. And the other compromise always is from the ABS is household income. And a lot of people are happy. They're always, you hear people say, oh, you know, average household income. It's a pretty good proxy for CIFA. But at the end of the day, CIFA is, even when they had legislation about how many poker machines could be in various areas in Melbourne, it was put into legislation based on the CIFA of every uh, local government area defined how many poker machines they could have. So the government even used it as their way of putting legislation in of describing the socioeconomic areas. I hope that helps. Thank you, Peter. Uh, there are no other questions in the chat box at the moment, but if anybody yeah. has a question now and they'd like to ask it, please do so. Please jump on. Uh, okay, Bob, thanks, Peter. You have uploaded suppliers market into the sale category. Sorry, I can't see the whole thing. Um, okay, we'll come back to you, Bob. Well, just, open, just call it out, Bob. Just unmute yourself. Yep. Peter, I was just interested in, have you ever uploaded a supplier by category if I'm in the um, aerated water, uh, producing it in cans and it's got, uh, it's got these attributes and so forth, can I overlay that on a retail uh, mango map of yes yep. we, we could do something like uh, you might have data in terms of dollars sold per suburb or dollars sold per postcode whatever you've got there we can whack it on a mango map uh, mango can have huge numbers of layers and in fact it's so strong we still use it for f45 worldwide we run 60 countries of their mapping on F45, for F45 worldwide on Mango Maps. So no problem at all, Bob. Any data that you have, we can normally put it, including all of the suppliers. You could have everybody you supplied to, click on their name, up would come how much their sales were, whatever you wanted to do with that. And then if there's data on area sales, because government might have data, we could always put that layers in as well. Thank you, that's great. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Uh, do we have any other questions from anyone? Okay, well, I think we've almost hit our uh, one o'clock, so. Yeah, very close. My final point is thank you very much. Uh, Sue and Dorianne will be sending out a video of this and we'll probably put it on our website, etc. cetera. But uh, anyone who wants to contact me, my details are all there. Please feel free to give me a call and uh, look forward to being in touch at some stage. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining Bye. us today.